Hello, my name is Jeff Sertens, and welcome to my guitar instructional video. During the next hour or so, I'm going to show you some techniques and exercises that will hopefully unlock a few artistic doors for you. This video, Advanced Soloing Techniques, will begin with a few key exercises that will develop the dexterity to uh, fully utilize the scales, licks, tricks, and patterns that will follow. I get asked most often by my guitar students on how to solo in the rock and blues styles. So this video will cover that topic exclusively, and I'd like to begin it with some exercises, scales, arpeggios, patterns, shapes, licks and tricks, and an overview of how to blend it all together to make your soloing just a little bit more diverse. I hope that you enjoy the video. Now let's get started. First thing we need to do is to get in tune with each other. I use a standard A440 tuning. I'm going to give you one string at a time. Do your best. Use your ear. Take your time. Here's the E string. Here's the B string. The G string. D string, the A string, and last but not least, the E string. Here's your E chord. The guitar is supposed to be fun, right? Well, if you desire to have blistering chops and want to be able to leap tall buildings in a single scale, you need to approach the guitar as an athlete would approach their sport. Music comes from the heart and the mind, but eventually has to get to the fingers. If your fingers can't play what you hear in your head, then the problem is purely physical. So let's wipe out the physical handicap and give your mind the freedom to play from the heart. When I was studying at the Berklee College of Music, I became obsessed with exercises that develop speed and technique. Everyone I met had more chops than the next. I spent basically every waking hour trying different approaches to exercises until finally finding the routine that was best for me. All soloing revolves around shapes and patterns. So I developed exercises to get you proficient with all of the most common shapes. <laughs> Let's start with the chromatic run. We need to be fluid in both the vertical and horizontal chromatic exercises. The first exercise, let's call the vertical one, two, three, four slide. I need you to have strict alternate picking, and that's down, up, down, up, or up, down, up, down, depending on your preference. It'll look like this. Let's try it real slow. <laughs> Sounds a little boring, but it's a really good exercise. If you have patience and you stick with it and you work your way up, it'll sound pretty cool. It almost sounds like the flight of the bumblebee. So bear with me and I'll try to play a little faster. It's pretty cool. 
I'd like to go next with a basic vertical exercise. The vertical exercise is going to go from the top of the neck to the bottom of the neck. And it's still using strict alternate picking and the one, two, three, four finger rule. I'll do it real slow. Now when you get here, let's just slide up one fret and then work our way back up. And that too, we have to practice strict alternate picking again. And let's work it up fast, slow increments at a time. And it should sound something like this. Now that gets you going up and down. Going up and down is real important for string skipping exercises. But we also need to blister from the first all the way down to the last fret on the guitar. And we're going to use some vertical exercises. Still using the one, two, three, four rule and the strict alternate picking. I'll play it slow. Now let's try that exercise at speed. Remember, work your way up slowly, take your time, be patient, and then we'll try to get to be as fast as we can be. Let's try this. Now remember, the best way to practice speed is to use a metronome. I highly recommend it. Use a metronome to chart your progress. Start slowly, set a tempo, and work your way up until you develop an even meter and a clean picking stroke. Good luck. There are three types of picking techniques that I'd like to talk about as well. Different picking techniques give the guitar a little different sound. Sometimes you want to attack the strings hard, be a staccato kind of flavor to it, which is a real abrupt sound. Sometimes you want a fluid sweeping motion. Um, and other times you want a real legato motion, which is a real smooth, like a violin almost sound. So let's talk about how to get that. First thing we want to talk about is alternate picking. Now, to do a real good alternate pick, you need to need to know the pick. I use a basic um, extra heavy pick. I like it real heavy because if the pick is thin, it flutters a lot and it takes a long time for the pick to get back to its original spot. You don't want it to bend a lot. So I recommend, especially if you're starting out in a speed picking kind of guitar, to use a heavy pick as possible. Um, an extra heavy would be the best. So alternate picking is strict up, down, up, down, or down, up, down, up. I'd like to give an example of it, of just how I would practice it. I want you to watch your hand. Don't worry about what your left hand does. Matter of fact, I'm just going to hold the guitar over here, just mute the strings, and we're only going to focus on the right hand right now. Unless you're a lefty, focus on your left hand. So here we go. I'm going to start an E string. Down, up, down, up picking. So I start with a down stroke, and then I come straight up. Try not to angle your pick and bite it. You want a straight attack as you can. And don't bite in too deep because that'll also slow down your stroke. Go in just enough to get the point across. No pun intended. So watch this. Down, up, down, up. That's alternate picking. And that's how I would practice it. And I do it on every string. And if you want to get the left hand involved, let's do it with a simple exercise like we did with the chromatic runs. I 
and use your own imagination, you'll probably come up with some a lot better than I did. The next type of picking is called sweet picking. Now sweet picking is really, really effective, but you have to use it in the right spot. If you want to get that real fluid sound going from line to line, use sweet picking. And that's one solid downstroke or one solid upstroke. And I'll give you a quick example of it. You're basically going to take the side of the pick and slide across the top of the strings in one fluid downstroke. I'm going to do it muted so it doesn't sound, sound real bad. It goes like this. That's a downward sweep. An upward sweep is simply the opposite. Together. Now I would practice this with a string skipping exercise. A string skipping exercise is something that will go from the E string to the A string to the D string to the G string in consecutive order. Or skip the A string, go right to the D string. Skip the G string, go right to the B string. You need that sweet picking motion to get that across. I'm going to do an A minor arpeggio. I'm going to start it on the 12th fret. And don't worry, I'm going to show you this arpeggio a little later. But just worry about my right hand. <laughs> I went all the way down, I did a little hammer on here, and then I went all the way up. Watch again. Now if we did that a little bit faster, it would sound like this. Maybe that wasn't a little bit faster, but you get the idea, I think. I'm going to do it again. Now you can get a lot of cool sounds. I'm sure uh, hopefully everybody has heard the Woody Woodpecker song from that lovely cartoon, that little woodpecker. I'll try to sweep pick that. That's the idea about sweep picking. Now the last kind of picking I want to talk about is called no picking. Now no picking, I've never heard that before, but I think it's the best terminology to use to get the point across. We're not even going to use the right hand. You really have to develop your left hand strength which the exercises are really important in doing. So the no picking technique will give you that legato violin kind of feel. And it's really good if you're playing live in front of people because now it's time to show off. And you can just take your right hand away and feel free to do your runs with your left hand. I'll give you an idea of some things that I would practice. I showed you some exercises, the one, two, three, four, the one, two, three, four slide, vertical, horizontal. Do them without a pick. Watch carefully. No right hand here. Now it takes a lot of finger strength. It's going to be hard at first. Don't please don't get discouraged. Try it. Pull off with your fingers. Attack them hard and you'll get it. And you can get some pretty interesting sounding runs. I'll try to come up with something right now for you guys to get the point across. <laughs> I'll do that again. Alternate picking, sweet picking, and no picking. Every exercise, every scale, everything I give you today, if you want to be ahead of the game, practice it using all three of those. Good luck. Now that your fingers are warmed up and ready to go, let's talk about those 12 wonderful notes and how to solo with them. The two most commonly used scales in the mode family are the major scale or the Ionian mode and the minor scale which is called the Aeolian mode. Now I want to back up a little bit and we have to play these scales in what we call positioning. And position playing is very important so you can keep like a conservation of motion concept. I want you to move your fingers as little as possible to keep your, your timing, your rhythm, and the flow constant. So position is a little definition for you, and I'll say it slow. Position is determined by where your index finger falls naturally on the fretboard. Your index finger is allowed to move one fret forward, and your pinky is allowed to move one fret back. Let's look at the fretboard and go over this. I'm on the fifth fret. My index finger is on the 5th fret, my 2nd finger is on the 6th, my 3rd is on the 
seventh, and my pinky's on the eighth. I am in what's called the fifth position. Because remember, position's determined by where your index finger falls naturally, and I'm on the fifth fret. Now, in this position, those little two clauses I explained, the pinky, the index finger, excuse me, can move one fret forward. It can go here. But the other three fingers have to stay on their corresponding frets. The pinky can also move one fret back. And you notice these three fingers stay here. So position is determined by where your index finger falls naturally. Now the major scales and the minor scales, and all the scales for that matter, are made up of formulas. And we'll give you some formulas that will help you in theory. Let's start with the major scale. We're going to use the key of C, and the major scale is made up of all the natural notes. Now natural means no sharps and no flats, just C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. All the natural notes from C to C. We're going to play them in the fifth position. Now, the, the half steps in the formula for this scale is between the third and fourth notes and between the seventh and eighth notes. So it's a whole step away from all of the other notes except the third and fourth and the seventh and eighth. And that's where it's a half step. So I'm going to start this with second position. So remember, I'm going to get my fingers in the second position. My index finger falls naturally on the second fret. And we're going to play the C major scale. I'm going to play it real slow first. All the notes C to C. <laughs> Remember, I use strict up-down picking. And if you notice, my fingers and my hand never moved. And I utilized that conservation of motion thing. Remember, we talked earlier about approaching the guitar as an athlete would approach a sport. Well, let's make believe we're Bruce Lee for a second. And we don't want to move at all. We want one hit to be real accurate and precise. I'm going to play a little faster, second position. Now, fifth position, let's move our fingers down. Fifth fret, my index finger, it falls naturally on. I'll play it slow. C major scale again. I'll play it a little faster. And this position, my fingers move even less. Nice and fluid. We're going to move to the seventh position. I'd like to quiz you here. I wish you're here right in front of me, so let's make believe you are. You're right in the room with me. I'm going to ask you a question now, and I want you to answer it. Where's my index finger have to be if I want to play in seventh position? Right, seventh fret. So here we are. I'm on the seventh fret with my index finger. I'm going to play the C major scale slow. <laughs> a little faster for you and you'll see that this position also my whole hand my thumb moves very little now the next position is called the ninth position now this one starts out kind of funny because it starts out with a finger stretch so if I asked you that last question it's pretty tricky now ninth position you notice my finger is on the ninth fret but the ninth fret on the E string is not a C the eighth fret is. So we're going to start out with that little clause. I'll play it slow. We'll play a little faster now. This one I like because it has three notes per string. And it's real fluid with your alternate picking. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It goes like this. And the last position is 12th position. This one's really confined. We're going to slide all the way down to the 12th fret with our index finger. And if you have large fingers, it's kind of hard to stay back here. But position is really, really important. We're going to start out on the 12th fret, C major scale. I'll play it slow. I'm 
play a little faster now. Now that's all the positions. Second, fifth, seventh, ninth, and twelfth. You might ask why I think it's important to do this. It's going to take our guitar neck and use the entire length of the guitar. I just don't want you to solo around here and play all your chops and all your scales here and then decide to just pick up and jump down to here. We can make it fluid and use the entire neck and utilize the entire guitar. Remember, we want to play what we hear in our head, what we feel in our heart. We have to get it to the fingers. That was the major scale. Now the most often used soloing scales in the rock and blues vein are the minor, scale or the aeolian mode, and the minor pentatonic. Let's start with the minor scale. In the mode family, it's called the aeolian mode. Now we talked about the major scale previously, and the half steps in the major scale were between the third and fourth and the seventh and eighth step. In the minor scale, they're between the second and third and the fifth and sixth. Now the minor scale has a really sweet note in it that wakes up the ears. It's called the flat third. And the flat third makes the second sound so nice. Now remember, all the notes are numbered. C is 1, D is 2, E is 3. So when I say flat third, it's just the third note in the scale. Let me give you a little idea of what that flat third sounds like. <laughs> Now the C minor scale, now that you know the flat third sounds like, I'll play it real slow. I'm going to play it in the seventh position. I'm going to play it in the eighth position. I'll play a little faster, C minor scale. Now I'd like to give you a little secret here. If you play the C minor scale, or any minor scale, and play it in what I call a thirds pattern, we're going to go from C, instead of going to D, we're going to go to the E flat. And then instead of going to the next note, we're going to skip one, and we're going back. It sounds like this slow. <laughs> Play a little faster, and you'll see what I mean. It has a really nice touch to it. Great to use in a flurry of runs in a solo. Now, I'm going to make you work a little bit. I showed you all the positions for the major scale. I'd like you to try to figure out all the positions for the minor scale from the second all the way on up. Remember, your root is C, and the formula for the scale has half steps between the second and third and the fifth and sixth. Stick with it. And I want you to try to practice your strict alternate picking. Try some with some sweet picking and try some with the no picking. Use a metronome, stick with it. Good luck. The next scale I want to talk about is called the minor pentatonic scale, or better known as the blues scale. I love this scale, but if you strictly play this, you're going to be real you know, conformed into that blues sounding uh, style. So let's play this scale now, give you some ideas, but at the end of this section I'm going to sort of 
open your eyes to how you can link this to the minor scale, put little key fragments of it to make it work well for you, and, and not really sound like a blues player. Now, the minor pentatonic scale has five notes. Six makes the octave. The formula for this scale has two step and a half steps, and they're between the first and the second and the fourth and the fifth notes. Really unique sound. I'm going to use the key of C because it's in everybody's ears right now. We've been sticking in there. And I like to play the C minor pentatonic scale for you real slow. I'm going to play it in eighth position. <laughs> Now those five notes sound really good and it's a really nice way to start using some bends and some vibrato effect. We're going to cover the bends and vibrato in another video, but I'll give you a little idea of what I mean. <laughs> I just used the first couple notes of that scale, bent it up a whole step, shook it a little bit. That's called vibrato. Well, like I said, we're going to cover that in another video. Let's get back to the scale. I use this minor pentatonic scale a lot, just key fragments of it. And we're going to learn how to link them to the minor scale. I'm going to give you a little idea. <laughs> Now I use the minor pentatonic, get a little blues lick in there, and then slid into that flat third of the minor scale. I'll do it again. Try to do it again. Now I'll start working my way down the fingerboard and give you some more examples of how that minor pentatonic will work. And I'm going to link it again with some minor. I'm not going to start up top this time. I'm going to start down in the higher strings. That was really basic, but I really tried staying in the minor scale and in the minor pentatonic. It's going to forget about the lesson right now. I'm just going to try to flow and play in and out of that for you. And I tried to stay in eighth position as much as I could didn't sound too good because I wasn't using the whole neck, but I was trying to give a strict example of what scales are used for. Scales aren't music. Music isn't here. But the scales at least know where your fingers should go when you want to get that point across. So have some fun with the minor pentatonic. Link it with the minor scale. Link it with something we're going to talk about in the upcoming section called arpeggios. Good luck. <laughs>
I'm going to do a little linking pattern called a pedal tone, which we're going to talk about later. And I'm going to end it with the C minor arpeggio. I'll do it slow. <laughs> Now that was a root 5 scale. I'm going to play that real slow for you because I know that sounds pretty good. Starting on C, I'm going to play the 1st, the flat 3rd, the 5th, and the 8th of the C scale. Now if you want to give it that real nice violin-y sound, we're going to go back to the sweep picking. Now there's all kinds of different ways to play arpeggios. Those were some of the the rudiment ways. Now we have two roots. We have a root six, which is called our E string, and a root five. And I want to start getting used to that word because I'm going to throw it around a lot with my, with my scales. The root six is using the top E string, and the root five is using the next string. So let's switch keys for a second and go into A, a little centered on the neck a little better, and I can use more of it to give you a good example. We'll use the A minor arpeggio with a root six. Play it slow. Now you notice I had that nice slide in there. Play a little faster and you'll see how this sounds. Let's link it with the root 5 minor arpeggio. Now let's try it all together. I'm going to slide my way from the root 6 all the way up to the root 5 and work my way back up. Let's see how it works. Try it a little faster. I want to give you one final little arpeggio to work with. We're going to start with the higher string pattern. Real simple little finger pattern. I'm going to give you the major one first. Looks like this. I'm going to give you the minor finger pattern now. Remember, just flat the third. Now they sound pretty nice. And you can work out some patterns and some, some chord structures that you feel sound good to you, and just play the arpeggios and link them. I'm going to play all the arpeggios that are diatonic to the chord of D. I'm going to work my way up from the second position all the way to the 14th position. Arpeggios are a lot of fun. Good luck. I love this next section. This section, remember we talked about in the very beginning, I want you to start developing your own inner voice and to open up your mind to some, some of your own ideas. Well, this is called permutations and patterns. We're going to start with just four notes, any four notes that you'd like. I'm going to use an example, G, A, B, and C today. Forget about those notes for a moment. And if you have a piece of paper in front of you, just write down the four letters A, B, C, D in that order. Now, there's a word called permutations. If you take these four letters, we're going to call them notes, A, B, C, D, and you permutate them, meaning switch the order of them, mathematically there's over 20 different variations of taking the four notes. So if you're stuck in a rut, and you have just this little lick or pattern that you've been playing and it's your, it's your, your wow chop related to this concept. And if it starts with G and the next note is A, the next note is B, and the last note is C, well maybe start with the A and go A, G, B, C, or C, B, G, A. You get the idea? They're called permutations. I'll give you an example. Let's take those notes again. G, A, B, C. <laughs> Now it's real simple. 
but it's only four notes. That means you can practice it a million times a day, like this. <laughs> Pretty cool. That's used just when you need an instant flurry to show your speed, to get a point across. We're going to take that same pattern and just change the notes, the first two of them, to AG instead of GA. Sounds like this. Totally different sound using just the same four notes. So I want you to experiment with that and play with it a little bit. Take four notes, any notes, any key, any position, come up with a finger pattern that works well for you, and then practice it, permutate it, write them down. Some are going to sound good. I'll give you a few examples of how I can link some permutations. Doesn't really sound good when you do them slow, but I'll link them and you'll see how I can go from point A to point B in a real fast, fluid manner. I'll, I'll permutate that a little bit. I'll permutate it again. I think you get the idea. So practice with them. Have a lot of fun with it. Take your time, use your ear first. Four notes can sound so good. Take your time again. Permutations, good luck. Now before you think I'm crazy with this next topic, I just want to clear things up. I'm a little bit crazy, and that's it. Anyway, this next topic I call agogics. And I spent years working on this while I was at Berkeley. I had a really cool teacher who um, dared to deviate from my Berkeley curriculum. And um, we talked about relating geometric shapes to the fretboard. And what that did for me was it opened up a whole new array of notes and sounds that I would never have found by noodling. You know, you pick up the guitar and you go to what you play best and you go to your scales and your arpeggios, but you stay conformed into just that one little genre or area. So let's just take a real abstract thought process right now. Think of a geometric shape, a triangle, a circle, a diagonal line, a straight line that has three or four points connecting it. Maybe if we, if we go to the fretboard, maybe the first two notes are side by side and then the last one is here. That, that's what I mean about the, the connecting the, the dots. Now, shapes are really fun. You can use them with all the patterns and permutations that we came up with in the previous sections, or just start anew. When I first started developing this concept, I went home and I drew over 50 patterns. I went nuts. I was drawing circles and triangles, and I'd take that triangle and I'd look at the guitar and how I can relate that to the fingerboard. And I came up with really unusual sounds. Some of them were really bad, some of them were good, but they were unusual and they enabled me to hear things that my mind didn't, my ears didn't, and my heart didn't feel. But now once I heard them, oh, I wanted them. So let's try this. Remember, I'm not that crazy, so bear with me. Let's do a triangle pattern. <laughs> Looks like an upside down triangle. Sounds really nice. Eric Johnson uses a lot of those patterns. But I'll give you some examples of how a triangle pattern can be used to sound kind of melodic. I'll use the key of A. Well, I ended that a little differently, but you get the idea. All triangles. Now let's. Let's just switch geometric shapes a little bit. I want to use a straight line. And Alan Holdsworth does a lot of these long stretches, straight line kind of things. I'll try to give you an example. It's 
not a scale. It's not really a pattern. It has that shape to it. And because of that, made it sound really neat. Experiment it. Play with a lot of different shapes. I recommend drawing some out first. First think of a key that you'd like. Then think of a pattern or a permutation that you previously came up with that you like the series of notes. And then change them to fit into that geometric shape. And watch how it opens up a whole new array of notes and expression for your guitar. Good luck. Okay, we've established that I'm just a little bit crazy. Well, let's get a little worse. Next section is called bitonal pendulums. Yeah, bitonal pendulums. They're made up of two three note patterns that are linked together. So, bitonal, two different tones, but when you work them together, they sound really nice. I worked at this too while I was in Berkeley. I spent a lot of time with this, finding what chords, what notes, how to link it, and I was inspired to do this from a couple of reasons, and I have to share this with you. The first was from a real simple song by The Police. It sounds something like this. <laughs> Now that used that nine note, the ninth, added a really nice tension in there. I'll play it again. Now I love that sound and how to link that with my scales. And the other credit I have to give is I was on my way home one day from school. I picked up a guitar player magazine. And in it was one of those little sound pages, those little square records. And uh, boy, I couldn't wait to get home and listen to it. It was by some unknown guitarist at the time called Joe Satriani. Never heard of him before. And uh, he played these little six note groupings just like I was working on. And he beat me to it. And uh, I got to give him credit because it was really good. But I still, I listened to what he took. And I developed my own little ways of playing. And it really helped my soloing a lot and opened my ears again to a, to a different sound and a different way to approach notes. So I'll give you an example. This is um, the first part of the A bitonal pendulum. The next half sounds like this. Doesn't sound good when I play it like that. I'll do it again so nice by itself and that's so nice by itself but when you put them together you get that pendulum effect now play with different chords and different sounds that was in the A minor think of all the notes that you can use take a simple progression A minor F G, and try to come up with the unique sounds that each of those bitonal phrases has. I'll give you an example. Good luck. For most of the video, we dealt with advanced soloing concepts and some abstract ideas. Now I think it's time 
to focus on uh, just having some fun. What do you think? Let's work on my bag of mojo tricks. My students have been bugging me for some time now to, to give them some of my most cliched licks, and so I'm going to put it on tape for everybody. We're going to start with some pedal tones. Now, a pedal tone is a note that gets repeated throughout a phrase, just one note. Could be a series of 50 notes, but one note is getting repeated back to. I'll give you an example. We're going to use the key of um, A. Now I kept going back to the E note. And I worked my way up a little finger pattern. A little faster, it'll sound like this. Now you can work that pattern and work up diatonically in the chord. That's one example of a pedal tone. Now I do a lot of two-handed tapping, and I also have some pedal tones that I'd like to share with you using the, the uh, index finger tapping. Now I kept repeating the E note again with my index finger. I'll play a little faster so you get the idea. That was a pedal tone. Now we can take that one note that gets repeated and add another one to it, and it's called an ostinato. Now an ostinato is two notes that get repeated throughout a phrase. Here's an example of an A minor ostinato. I'll play it a little faster now. I was going back and forth. And here's another one. Here's it a little faster. tones are used primarily for linking. I use them a lot to link between different positions and different shapes. Have a lot of fun with them. Good luck. All right, now mojo number two trick. This one has a little vibrato effect to it. I'm going to use a vertical, uh, a horizontal vibrato, working my way up and down. Sounds like this. Slow. <laughs> Doesn't sound like much, but let's speed it up a little bit. Mojo number three lick has, has a really neat sound. Like the minor scale has the flat third in it. This lick emphasizes the flat five. Here's an example. So I'll try to use it in a little context in a key of A. Mojo number four lick uses a technique called sliding into and out of notes. Gives you a really sharp, abrupt attack, really neat effect. Here's an example.
Mojer number five lick is like a Paganini type octave lick, used a lot by classical violinists. Here's an example. <laughs> Play a little faster. <laughs> Mojo number six lick deals with the real subtlety, the subtle little bend. Not the whole step bend that you would get in the blues, but a real subtle half step quarter step bend on the B string and the E string. I'll give you some examples on, the, on those two strings. And last but not least, mojo lick number seven. I call these my nasty little three-noters. They're little three-note tritones. Sounds like this. Well, I hope you like my little bag of mojo tricks. Have fun with them. Try to make your own up. Well, welcome to the world famous Stone Pony in Asbury Park, New Jersey. This is the home of Bruce Springsteen and all the New Jersey local legends. They were kind enough to let us use the club today to film the video and I really want to thank Dominic Santana for his, his kind care. We're talk about my gear. It's my live stage rig. I basically use five different amps to switch back and forth between my, my tones that I need. I use the Carvin Legacy a PV5150. Two of my favorite amps are uh, two Blackface 1964 pre-CBS Fender Bandmasters. We have a guy in New Jersey, his name is Rick Santucci, did some modifications on these and restored them back to life and a little bit better. The Bandmasters handle my clean sound and there's just nothing like it, just a true warm brown sound. The Marshall 2550, it's a Silver Series amp, is my main dry amp. I run it dry, it gives me that good crunch sound that I use on predominantly all of my dirty sounds. So my amps have no effects whatsoever through them. We're gonna talk about all of this in another video that deals exclusively with my gear, but I'm gonna give you a brief overview today. I have two different preamps that I play through that drive my wet signals. The first one is the Mesa Boogie Triaxis and then the brand new Egnator modular preamps. Bruce Egnator designed these preamps to model after the world's best amps. I have four different ones here and I chose to use a 1959 Baseman, a Vox AC30, a Marshall Superlead, and one of Bruce's own designs, it's called the Egnator High Gain. I can switch back and forth between them using my GCX ground control unit. Um, I use all my amps in conjunction through my GCX switcher. I actually have two of them. I have one in the amp rack over here that I use as well. And the GCX enables me to take all my amps, all my effects, select any combination or permutation of them, put them all together, gives me the flexibility to hear whatever tone I have in my head and get it out. <clears throat> I don't use too many effects, although it looks it. Basically, all I use is my Eventide H3000 to split the signal up a little bit. I set it for a really fat, warm chorus sound. It makes the sound really big. The Aphex noise gate keeps everything I have crystal clear and quiet. When we're not playing, when my volume's on 50, it's crystal clear, not a hum or buzz through it. Finally, I send everything first through my Sennheiser wireless. I've tried all the wireless units and the Sennheiser unit makes me the happiest. I don't have any signal loss, keeps my tone true, and 
my belt pack has survived a lot of beatings. Really good unit. Now all those amps get powered through my custom made Dynacoustics cabinets. I use six of the cabinets. They were made by Tommy Riley of Dynacoustics. He designed these. I have my upper half of all my stacks, the Celestian Vintage 30s, and then the bottom halves are all the EV 100 watts. I have these custom painted to uh, give me my trademark brick wall of sound. Now we come to my favorite part. These are my babies. I play and endorse Warrior guitars exclusively. This guitar is my, my signature model. J.D. Lewis of Warrior Guitars and I, we designed this to meet my exact specifications. This was like a dream come true. We, we detailed the neck, made it really wide and flat and the spacing. It's unbelievable. If you ever dreamed of picking up an instrument that fits your, fits your hand like a glove, this is it to me. This is my number one. We have some custom made pickups. My neck position, we call it the holy grail. This sound is, is just so full and warm and, and emanates through the guitar. It's actually louder than most of the humbuckers I've ever heard. And JD had this double humbucker in the back custom designed to enhance my tapping techniques and my harmonics. We sunk a Floyd Rose in here and I told JD that I needed to have this pulled back a whole step and a half and I wanted it to float like a tire tube and uh, just subtleties if I just tap the guitar it floats and it stays in tune perfect. We position the knobs and the volume knobs and the, the pickup selector switch to make it efficient for me while I was playing live just unbelievable. And the, the Warrior guitars, all of the Warrior guitars, not just the signature guitar, this guitar we actually named the JS 924. And 924 is my favorite scripture. It says that the Lord will have the credit for my talent and I will triumph in the works of his hands. And we're going to name this guitar the JS 924. And on the back, this is a prototype, it's kind of beat up. JD wrote a little message on her and he called this my sword. And this is my sword that I try to get a positive message across to all the kids that hear us play. The guitar is a real powerful thing. It's a lot more than just music. We have another guitar. This is one of JD's finest pieces of art here. This is called the Archangel. And this is Michael the Archangel casting Lucifer out of heaven, emphasizing that good will always triumph over evil. And this guitar is made of seven different types of wood, has over 500 pieces of It's a piece of work. They are truly the finest guitars made today. This features a special pickup. Sounds better than any music I've ever played through. has a stereo playing
top just damage. Guitar are great. But with the new design and the Guitars. Exclusively. 